Even to this day, we're still feeling the aftershocks of what this cult did to society. But the idea was everything in the outside world was sin, Satan, demons. Dad would be very methodical about it, and he would sit me down and explain to me how I was a dirty, no-good, rotten sinner. My mom skipped all that. Physical abuse was common. IBLP taught authority above everything else. When you were out there in the world, you were supposed to be constantly smiling and constantly trying to get people to come in and you know you had to be the shiny happy people they teach you to grow up so fast as well in that system because we were not only supposed to be a special breed of homeschoolers who were learning the only right thing we had to be better than the world would show other people the way and want them to join our cult essentially you knew and you never talked about this why he's like well talking about it hurts the ministry i said dad it's in the paper it's on the news People know about this. What are we doing about it? And he's like, well, you know, just sometimes things happen. And I was just, he's like, we, we just need to focus on the ministry and that's it. And I'm like, that's not good enough. I grieve the fact that I was ever part of anything that hurt people. Yeah. That still haunts me to this day. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high-demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you want to see our faces instead of just listening on one of those podcast apps, you can go to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness. It's so helpful when you guys interact with the videos because it does shoot it out to more people so others can become aware of these cults, these patterns of manipulation, and see these guests who are bravely coming on and sharing their stories. Don't forget to leave those comments down below too, those words of encouragement for them. So today's guest, we were connected to him through Lindsay, who we just had on talking about the IBLP, which is the Institute in Basic Life Principles. You may have seen it on the Shiny Happy People documentary that was released just about a year ago, or a little over a year ago, with the Duggars. If you are familiar with the Duggar family, this is the ideology that they were following. So it's not a religion itself. It is an ideology that permeates a lot of different Christian fundamentalist groups or fundamentalist Christian groups more on the extreme side. So today we're going to be talking about his life, how his parents got him involved, what it was like growing up in the IBLP, even overseas in the Netherlands, and how it affected his life. So thank you so much for joining us, Chad Harris. Thank you so much, Elise. It's an honor to be here. Um, I've loved your other interviews on this topic, and I'm just very grateful that uh, you asked me to be on. Oh, thanks so much. And you're doing a lot of work on this whole topic as well. You talk about culty things and the fundy lifestyle over on your TikTok, which people can find you over there. Your handle is at Archradish, right? That's right. I've been on there since 2020 uh, talking about IBLP and Christian nationalism in general, but with a focus on IBLP because I'm not an expert in much, but I was part of that cult and I can talk about that. Yes. And you were also a part of the documentary, Shiny Happy People. What was that like? That was an overwhelming experience. For years, I've been wanting people to talk about IBLP because it was just such a blatant cult, as I called it in the documentary, a cult in plain sight, that I was shocked that nobody had really done a deep dive into it, particularly with the Duggars being as popular as they were. So one of the reasons I started on TikTok, partially it was a bit of a supplement to therapy because my therapist uh, told me that I should find a way to share my story in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> and I was like, uh, it's going to be a little hard to do, but thankfully that was the one thing I could do while I was still social distancing. So I started talking about it on there, hoping it would get a little bit of traction and also to help work through uh, some feelings I was having at the time. I was uh, told that there were directors looking for people who had been in IBLP through one of our various recovery groups online. And I reached out to Olivia Chris, the director, and I told her, I was like, I was in this cult and I would uh, very much like to share my story if it helps. So we had a Zoom call and we must have spoken for two hours and her and her uh, production partner, Lauren Andrade, they were both on the call. They started crying as I was telling my story. Mm -hmm. And I was actually kind of shocked because, I mean, you know, it's, it's my lived experience and everything. And to me, it was, you know, pretty much uh, 
routine. So I was like, oh, I hope I didn't upset you. And they're like, oh, no. They said, you know, this is just very similar to the stories that we've heard so far. And we're just sorry it happened to you. And they asked such very pointed and knowledgeable questions that I knew that they had done their homework. Mm. And I said, well, this is very refreshing because normally when I talk about IBLP, I have to clarify that it's not a particular church or denomination. It's an entire system that operated outside of any kind of oversight. And they already knew that and they knew exactly how to present it and ask their questions. And I felt very comfortable talking to them. And through TikTok, I met Lindsay Williams and Heather Heath, two of my closest friends in the world now. And I also told them, I was like, uh, hey, you know, they're looking to do a documentary. And I encouraged them to uh, come along as well. So we all three went in basically at the same time. And uh, we remain friends throughout. And of course, to this day, along with other docu-siblings, as we call them in the documentary. So <laughs> right. it was, it, it's been a great experience. That's so awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. So let's get into your story then. All of our audience is probably like, I want to hear the <laughs> amazing story of your life. So let's talk about your childhood, because I know that you weren't technically born into it, but your family converted when you were around eight. So Talk us through why your parents decided to get involved. Well, my parents have been homeschooling before I was born. My parents were missionaries to the Netherlands and Belgium in the late 70s and early 80s. They were part of the Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, IFB. And they had begun uh, teaching my older two sisters and older brother at home because they didn't agree with the Dutch school system. At the time, they were primarily based in the Netherlands, and they moved to Belgium because homeschooling was technically accepted there. My parents left the mission field in the early 80s because dad started losing his hearing. I was born on a brief stint that, where he pastored a church in England. I left there when I was 10 months old, so I lost my British accent. <laughs> um, but we eventually settled back in Alabama, where you know I kind of became of age and everything. I grew up, and I got to about school age, kindergarten, around that. And my parents thought, well, why don't we go ahead and just homeschool him all the way through? So I was the first child in my family to be fully homeschooled. My older siblings had been to various Christian schools before, back in the States and what have you. So they were going to try to homeschool me from the beginning. Of course, my older brother, he spent a year in Christian school here in the States to kind of reacclimate himself to America. And then Eventually, my folks decided to bring him in for homeschooling as well. The problem is there was about a 10-year gap in between me and my older brother. So finding homeschooling curriculum you know, that worked for both of us and such was rather expensive, and we had varying educational needs. And my mom, you know, she's not a trained teacher or anything by any stretch. So right about this time, while all this is going on, my parents sought an OBGYN who was a Christian because in our family, we believe that every doctor we had had to be some kind of, you know, at least aligned with us Christian. And they found one who was, you know, a very strong, you know, fundamentalist type Christian. And they started talking to him because my mom was entering her 40s. And I, as I said, I was born 10 years after my older brother, so they didn't want to go through that again. <laughs> and they talked about options to maybe prevent that from happening that weren't surgical. And the doctor said, well, I know your story. I know your faith. I know you've surrendered a lot to God. Why not leave the amount of children you have up to God? Okay, so can I clarify quickly? They meant you were an accident and they didn't want that to happen again. Oh, certainly. Yes. Got it. And your doctor took it upon himself to say, are you sure? Leave it to God. Yes. Well, you, they made it very clear to me from an early age that I was an accident, and they never really let me forget that. Mm. But after that, the two siblings I had after they consulted with that doctor, they were planned. They absolutely you know, tried for those two. So this doctor introduced my mom to the Quiverful movement, mm -hmm. which is the idea that children are a quiver full of arrows that you shoot out into the world based on a passage in Psalms. And the idea being that the more children you have, the more you can fight against the evil oppressiveness of a devil controlled world. And that was what this movement was based on essentially. So 
Quiverful is a larger movement of which IBLP happens to be a subset. Mm -hmm. And I know that my parents found IBLP through the Quiverful movement, uh, through this doctor who also attended the same seminars as they did right about the same time. So both the doctor's family, because he had children as well, and my family went to IBLP roughly about the same time. They became our dearest friends in the cult. IBLP here in Alabama mostly attracted doctors, you know, people of means, uh, the largest or one of the largest mega churches we have in Birmingham had an entire Sunday school that followed Bill Gothard and followed his teachings. And this doctor was part of that. So it was very prestigious for my dad because at that time we were in Walker County, Alabama, as I mentioned in the documentary, which is known for being a more or less declining coal mining county. And we were up on the northwest side of Birmingham where, you know, the economy was terrible, manufacturing was moving out and such, uh, mining was shutting down. And these folks on the south side of Birmingham, you know, these prestigious doctors and such, they kind of welcomed us into the fold through IBLP. Mm -hmm. So it was of a very, you know, high social ranking for my dad and my mom to be part of that while still trying to maintain a church in Walker County. So I think that was part of the allure of it. And also Bill Gothard really did a lot. Bill Gothard, of course, being the founder of IBLP, he did a lot to present the best face forward for his homeschooling products. He would bring all these well-groomed, well-behaved children out in front of parents and say, see, these are how your kids could behave at all times. And of course, I myself was something of a, what my folks called a strong-willed child because they followed James Dobson before they went with IBLP and they wanted that for me and my younger siblings. And so they went full on into IBLP and we started learning pretty much basically from the curriculum that uh, IBLP had, which was the ATI Advanced Training Institute. Mm -hmm. So we started when I was about eight years old. I'd already done some Abeka, some other various things, but that would be the core of my education moving forward to graduation. Okay. Well done explaining all of that. It's a lot. I'm just still stuck on this doctor taking it upon himself to tell your mother who was 40 or in her 40s that she should leave it up to God. I don't know. If you're a doctor and you're watching this, tell me if that's ethical because maybe it's fine and maybe you can push your religious ideology onto people, but I don't know if that's normal and I feel like that was wrong. I agree, but I mean, you have to admit it's kind of job security for him, isn't it? Yeah, as an OB, I mean, but it's just, it feels irresponsible i guess it is because as i know because i'm approaching 35 well i'm approaching 34 i don't want to get too ahead of myself here but i'm planning on having more kids and i know that at 35 it's considered geriatric which i don't really agree with that but i know that as you wait longer and longer to have children not that it's impossible or that you shouldn't do it but it does get more dangerous and if your mom was already like hey i don't want any more kids but then she is swayed because of this religious ideology, I feel like it's irresponsible of her doctor to push her to have more kids. I agree. And uh, it's been one of my, it's been a bit of a double-edged sword because when I did confront my parents later, not to get ahead of myself, but you, you know, at one point I did have that sit down with them where I was like, Hey, I think what we were raised in was wrong. You know, they would always use that as a counter argument. Well, if it hadn't have been for IVLP, your younger siblings wouldn't be here. That's not fair. It is not fair. I mean, I love my younger siblings to death, but at the same time, you know, the circumstances that brought us to that and everything were wrong and ended up being harmful to all of us. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it, it in retrospect, it was just a really, like you said, unethical, coercive thing to do. But I know that that wasn't the only doctor who was involved and who was you know, heavily promoting this as well. Mm. The book that the doctor gave my mother was literally called A Full Quiver. And my dad, uh, when we became missionaries later and went church to church, uh, sharing our vision, my dad ordered a bunch of books of A Full Quiver 
to give out to pastors at the churches that we visited to try to spread this message even further. So it's uh, almost like a uh, baby MLM, as it were. <laughs> uh, but you're encouraged to continue spreading this idea of procreating. Yeah. And it's also not just to have more children because that's what God wants. The purpose is so you can infiltrate the world, right? And exactly. impose your religious ideologies onto the world through getting into government, through getting into the school systems, through the military or whatever. They, and they are doing that, right? Well, that's that's the point. One of the things that they would always point to in the Quiverfold movement was, you know, revivals and such happened when folks were having more kids. Of course, also negating the fact that most people have more kids because a lot of kids died in childbirth back then. And, you know, in agrarian societies, you know, having kids around to do the work and everything was considered beneficial, you know. Mm -hmm. But they would always point to families like the uh, the Wesley family, Susanna Wesley, and I believe she had about 12 kids, you know, and they were like, well, you know, John and Charles Wesley, who eventually became influential in Methodism, they were part of that whole godly influence of, you know, having as many kids as possible through godly parents. And they took the verse, you know, as arrows in the hands of a mighty man, are, so are his children. Blessed is the man that have his quiver full of them. Mm -hmm. They took that to mean that the reason that you want to have these arrows of children was to fight a spiritual warfare against the rest of the world. They taught that the world system, governments and what have you, were all being run by Satan. And your best weapon was to procreate and raise up godly children to change the future. Yeah. It's Christian nationalism in its worst form. And the, the fact is, you know, when you have children, you're having entire individual human beings. They are not automatons. They are not robots. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to program them to doing your will. Right. Yeah, and that's what bothers me because if people want to have kids because they love kids and they want kids, have all the kids. Right. But that's not the intention here. It's having children because you see them as an agenda. Like they they're already set out in your mind to do your bidding, and that's just not fair. Like you said, they are fully autonomous human beings, or they should be. And so imposing your agenda for world domination doesn't seem fair. I agree. Yeah. And here you are stuck in this. You're at the beginning of this. So, but it seems like you got it pretty hard, even if your siblings came into it or they were born into it. It seems like you got the same treatment. So what changed in your house? Because I know, let me back up. I know IFB is already extremely fundamentalist. We've done a few interviews with people who are IFB. And I know that it's really strict already. And now you're layering on the Quiverful movement and you're layering on the IBLP. So what changed in the house or did anything change? A lot changed. So my older brother, of course, he grew up in the 80s, in the late 70s. He was allowed to have a lot more different kinds of toys than I did. He, um, let's see, of course, you know, he played with G.I. Joes. He played with like Voltron toys and stuff like that. Uh, he was allowed to watch, you know, movies that I would never be allowed to watch uh, later on. And for a while, my parents were a bit more permissive on Saturday mornings, like letting me watch, you know, different cartoons and such. I remember uh, Care Bears being one of them, of course, mm -hmm. old school Care Bears and, uh, you know, stuff like that. And I remember liking that as a kid. Oh, and the Disney Afternoon, of course, like all the little cartoons that went along with that. A lot of stuff on uh, PBS that I was allowed to watch. When my folks got serious about IBLP and they started going to the seminars, one of the first things that they attacked was having a TV in the house. Good IBLP families didn't have a TV. Or if they did, they only watched pre-approved, very strictly controlled films. Mostly things that had been approved by Gothard himself. Now, we would waver on that a little bit. And there is a reason why there are people who follow the rules more strictly than others. So pin in that, but we would sometimes waver a little bit on that back and forth, but as a general rule, especially when, you know, we were first into it and very zealous about IBLP, uh, we initially just disconnected the antenna that we had outside our house, which we lived way out in the boonies. So when that got disconnected, we no longer had access to any kind of network TV. We kept the VCR. We would mostly watch things that had been pre-approved. 
And the things that we watched from then on were heavily meticulously reviewed for any references to magic or anything that could be considered to be demonic or any kind of spiritual warfare that my folks felt like was being pushed on us from the TV that was strictly controlled. And it didn't have to be just TV. That's one example. One time I remember one of the preachers associated with IBLP taught that Calvin and Hobbes, the comic strip of the paper, was clearly demonic because Hobbes, of course, was a stuffed tiger who had only come to life, as it were, when Calvin's parents weren't around. So the reasoning was that Hobbes was clearly portraying some kind of demon that went around parental authority oh. through under the umbrella of authority that Gothard always talked about and was influencing Calvin to do evil. Therefore, the series was demonic, and my folks literally would staple paper over the comic in the paper itself and write on it, do not read, so I wouldn't be influenced by the demonic comic strip. Wouldn't that make you want to read it even more? Very much so. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually like in bookstores and stuff like sneak a peek at the little, uh, you know, compilation books and such. And of course, I have them all now because I'm an adult and I can do that. <laughs> yeah. So the, the idea, you know, bring it back to that idea of using children as arrows. The idea was everything in the outside world was trying to get you to become a slave to sin, Satan, demons, and such. Gothard taught that any part of your heart that you gave to sinful desires built a literal castle in your heart that had to be torn down by Jesus Christ. So the best way to not have to go through all that turmoil is to not have anything remotely considered to be demonic in the first place. And when the entire world is conspiring against you, there is a lot of stuff that you can no longer do. And we felt that in our family. Wow. The fact that he even calls it a castle, though, he should have used something like prison because a castle sounds pretty great. <laughs> well, he called it a stronghold, but, you know, the illustration was of a castle. So, okay. yeah, it was it was a whole thing. Okay. So were your younger siblings boys, girls? I have one younger brother and one non-binary younger sibling. Oh, okay. Of course, at the time, assigned female at birth. And, yeah, they came along later than I did. Uh, my younger brother is... Uh, seven and my youngest sibling is or i'm sorry came along seven years after me and my youngest sibling came along 10 years after me so there was a significant age gap on both sides of myself oh wow the reason i asked is because i wondered if your now sibling assigned female at birth had very strict rules with the whole like gender roles and everything as well oh absolutely like even my older sisters weren't allowed, and this is partly IFB as well, but it meshed very well with, with IVLP. You know, my sisters were always dressed modestly to the point where actually my um, second oldest sister, after she was married for about 30 something years, actually found out that her husband, who she considered her authority at that point, didn't care if she wore dresses or not. And she was like, wait, you mean all this time I could have like worn pants if I wanted to? He's like, yeah, I don't care. I, she's like, I just assume that's what you want. He's like, no. Oh so God. yeah, which first of all, it's messed up that she would have to ask his permission in the first place. Yeah. But at the, at the same time, like, you know, the, the modesty rules, if you look through all of Bill Gothard's um, teachings, there are literal pages and pages dedicated to how women should dress and mm -hmm. how they should act and what their roles are. And for guys, it was, Definitely, you know, there were rules for us too, but nowhere near as comprehensive. And of course, everything pointed to the kind of person that Bill Gothard found attractive. So gross. Which, you know, we all know what that led to. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what are some of the things that you want to tell us about your childhood that were influenced by IBLP? For a while at our church that my dad pastored, we did away with having... Um, age-separated Sunday school. We did what was called age-integrated Sunday school, where we would have we would have the families get together and break off into different family groups, and the fathers of each group would teach the rest of the kids in these little family teams uh, something from the scriptures, and we would all present it up front at the end of the Sunday school. 
the idea being that separating kids by age was a worldly thing and having families study together was more spiritual. I remember this being a trend in a lot of IBLP circles up to and including a lot of families withdrawing from churches uh, proper so that they could have like home churches with like-minded IBLP families. The idea being that if you're going to church with other non-IBLP people, that would be too much of a worldly influence for your children. So, you know, we started doing things like that. We would become more and more withdrawn. The kids I was allowed to play with was very heavily monitored. Not that there was really much of a danger anyway, because we were in rural Alabama. It's not like I had any neighbors within a hundred feet of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every friendship I had was uh, very much uh, scrutinized. Every single thing that came into the house was looked over and decided by my folks whether or not uh, it was demonic. If I showed any signs of actual, just normal childish behavior, like maybe talking back every once in a while or throwing a tantrum, my parents would very much take the time to scream at me and physically abuse me through, mm. people call it spanking, I call it hitting abuse. It's just all the same. It's, yeah, physical abuse was common and the you know, my dad would be very methodical about it and he would sit me down and explain to me how I was a dirty, no good, rotten sinner and how the things I had done made God, um, you know, require a punishment. And so that's when I would receive the abuse. My mom skipped all that and would just go straight to screaming, hitting whatever she thought would get the point across. Mm -hmm. So as we got further into IBLP, that behavior kind of escalated because IBLP taught authority above everything else. And if anything was challenging authority, that was an all out satanic attack. And Gothard taught that, you know, rebellion and such would be influenced by outside forces. There were, you know, certain papers that he uh, wrote where he blamed cabbage patch dolls and other families for causing a spirit of rebellion or misbehavior in children. Oh my so anytime my parents thought that I was being influenced by something, another toy or another book or something would get thrown out, sometimes burned. Wow. So yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's so much here. So Gothard blamed cabbage patch dolls for children's behavior so instead of learning child psychology and how to connect with children, it's beat them and throw away their toys. Pretty much. It, it, anything to get them under the umbrella of authority, which, as we talked about in Shiny Happy People, was this idea that, you know, the family and, you know, the father especially and, you know, spiritual leaders, your parents, they were supposed to be this umbrella keeping out the attacks of Satan uh, if you stayed under your proper umbrella of authority. And of course, many diagrams of that have shown multiple layers, enforcing patriarchal views where the husband is at the top. Christ is shown to be the top layer of umbrella and the ultimate protection of all of this, of course. But the secret that nobody really talked about was that Gothard was even over that because it was his interpretation of what the Bible said and yeah. his interpretation of what these attacks were that were taken as literal gospel in IBLP families. Mm -hmm. So authority had to be maintained for this system to work and anything that threatened that authority and especially threatened the fragile egos of the males in charge was considered to be demonic somehow. That's terrifying. And I would like to get into, if you remember it, the mindset of little you, because to me, it sounds like you have these very real threats of abuse and danger, and then you have these spiritual threats of danger if you leave the physical threats of danger, which is just a terrifying world to live in. You were taught to be scared on all fronts. I mean, fear was the motivator for you to stay in line between being afraid that the devil could ruin your life at any point by your misbehavior. And of course, there were other factors that played into it as well. My dad in particular, you know, told us that our mother 
had problems, uh, in, in his words, problems that women face on a regular basis that could cause them to go insane if they were too stressed out. So therefore, we had to be on our best behavior around mom at all times, or we might be responsible for her having to be institutionalized. Hold on. That is like the most archaic view of female psychology, mm -hmm. because they used to think that, right? Like women would go hysterical for whatever reason. I mean, they used to think that women orgasming was like them going hysterical. It's just the fact that your dad was saying that. Do you feel like that was specific to your family or was this an idea that most families had in these groups? I feel like parts of it kind of um, played into the IBLP, teach IBLP teachings quite a bit because the man, of course, the father of the family is responsible for everything that happens underneath him. And of course, women, the wives are considered beneath them. They are ultimately responsible and accountable to God for them. And another thing, too, that my dad would always point out was that the Bible said that, you know, a pastor should have his home in subjection to authority and such, and that he should be the ruler of his own home. And if we didn't display that, then he wasn't qualified. Therefore, he would have to quit and go work at Walmart, which somehow he portrays like the worst thing you could ever do. So it, it was things like that. I think part of it had to do with his position as a preacher. Part of it too, I believe, had to do with my mother's condition, which to this day, I, I, can't diagnose her. I'm not a professional. I don't know what it was, but there was definitely something that she needed help with that she never got. Mm. And I think having to deal with that and having the excuse of the IBLP to, you know, claim this authority over the children and over his wife and to, you know, hide behind this. Well, I'm responsible to God for this. So therefore, you know, I'm going to use any means necessary to keep everything in line. I think that had a lot to do with it as well. Yeah. So it was just a a big old mishmash of horrible, <laughs> I, I would have to say. And for someone like me, who is already considered to be the strong-willed child, and uh, as I found out later through therapy, the scapegoat of the family, because my parents would introduce me to other families as the kid we've had to spank the most. Mm. Yeah. Ha being in that position you were going back to that fear. It was just fear compounded on fear of the physical retaliation as well as I, cause I bought in, I'm thinking, Oh, the devil could also ruin my life at any point. So, you know, it's just, there was no escape. You are always looking over your shoulder. Yeah. So little you felt like you needed that correction. And I say that in huge air quotes, just in case the devil was present in you or you needed to better submit to the Lord. And I consciously tried, you know, I would keep telling my folks that, you know, I didn't want to misbehave, but you know, kids are kids and they're going to push boundaries. They're going to test the limits. They're going to explore and stuff like that. And I was a very, I was a very chatty child. I talked quite a bit, which I'm sure your listeners right now could never imagine that. But uh, <laughs> like, yeah, I was, I was quite chatty, very curious, always wanting to know how things worked. My parents taught me to read the encyclopedia for fun to try to get me to quiet down about that, which was a mistake, I feel like. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because once you teach a child how to read and how to learn and how to grow, then they're going to start questioning why are they being subdued? Right. Or maybe you didn't. But I feel like that's what would happen if you are allowing them to learn about the world. Oh, I, I very much did later as an adult. I tell you that. Yeah, they um, I, I have talked about this with Heather and Lindsay quite a bit. And I said, boy, didn't they mess up when they tried to make world changers? Huh? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that was their biggest mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Just so I have a full understanding of what it was like growing up in your family, what were some of the things that you would get in trouble for, like specific examples? Because I can't imagine it would be anything too serious. It would be something that they considered serious. One time I misquoted a Disney movie one time because, you know, kids, they just parrot things they hear on TV. I, I think it was something from the movie Robin Hood. And my older brother thought that I had said a swear word. And I had not. 
but I was also too ashamed of getting the quote wrong that I didn't want to say what I had said. Mm. For two hours, I was screamed at by both my older brother and my mom about, you know, what I had said and how me not being honest with them and everything was definitely the work of the devil. And it ended with my older brother sobbing and telling me that he just didn't want me to go to hell. Wow. Um, And another time I found out that the way I had been initially taught in school to hold my pencil while writing was incorrect, which is why I was having pain writing. But of course, me being a strong-willed child, <laughs> uh, after I was told by my dad, like, oh, well, you know, you should probably try it this way. I said, no, mom taught me this way and I'm going to do it that way. Mom ran to her room sobbing because I had defied my dad's authority. And I had to keep going into her room while she was laying there in the dark, sobbing, apologizing to her until she felt like I meant it. Whoa. So things like that. Minor things, things that kids go through all the time, but it was a big deal and the world had to stop until I was brought back in line. Mm -hmm. What gets me is the extra level of manipulation by saying you're led by Satan or you have Satan inside of you. Mm-hmm. which is just so far from the truth. Yep. I I didn't. I was just a kid. Yeah. And it's they teach you to grow up so fast as well in that system because we were not only supposed to be, you know, a special breed of homeschoolers who were learning the only right thing. We had to be better than the world. We had to outperform on every level. We were told we were the uh, cream of the crop. We were cr- the Christian Marines, as it were. And we were supposed to be well-groomed, you know, well-respected, mannerly and respectful, as my mom would say. And we were supposed to put on an example of what, um, you know, we were supposed to be a city on a hill and a light to the world that would show other people the way and want them to join our cult, essentially. And Gothard himself taught that teenagerhood was a myth. He said, you know, biblically, kids became adults when they were like 13. So I had a ceremony when I turned 12 to welcome me into manhood, uh, essentially, where all the men of the church, like, got me up front and, like, had this big ceremony where they laid hands on me and conveyed on me adulthood, I suppose. Uh, Didn't get me a car or anything, but but apparently you were supposed to be, um, you know, go straight from being a child to being an adult when you were 12 or 13. And one of the biggest revelations of my own recovery was when my counselor said your brain doesn't stop really growing until you're 25 like that's insane (laughs) like why would they say that and i had never heard that before i was like oh i just assumed we were supposed to know everything by teenagerhood she's like nope like you're you're still you know a developing adult at that point and you know you you definitely shouldn't have had all that put on you yeah That's wild. And that's what I mean when I say it's not based in any sort of child psychology and what's best for the child. And I say child because they're children. It's just what they think should be is what's to be. And you just have to go along with it. And uh, I don't know if if this is right. What do you think about maybe Bill Gothard saying that you're adults by the age of 13 because he had preferences for younger girls i wouldn't be surprised if that fed into it yeah honestly because they started girls uh those assigned female at birth you know young women they started them into these finishing schools as it were you know as soon as they were like 11 or 12 years old while and it was very blatant how they were doing it because while you know, boys like me were pushed off into this program called Alert Cadet at these seminars. The girls would be going to something called Excel, where they were learning how to sit properly and how to set a table and stuff like that. We were out there crawling around in the mud, uh, doing push-ups, running, you know, being put through obstacle courses, and I hated every damn minute of it because mm-hmm. um, that is not what I go for, and that those were not the things that I wanted to do. But I was told. I had to face up to these challenges if I was spiritual enough. If I wasn't spiritual enough, I would fail. And that would bode badly for me as the biblical man that I was supposed to be becoming at that point on my literal 12th birthday. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So you went into the Alert Academy. Isn't that the 
the little militia or like the little um, army kids, as it were, for the <laughs> IBLP? Well, it's 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 the junior version of that. I didn't go to the full on alert academy. A lot of my friends did. And I echo what Heather Heath told me about it one time. She said, no one ever came back from alert better. And I just did the three-day version during one of the Knoxville seminars in 1997 called Alert Cadet. And we spent three whole days playing military, marching around, you know, like I said, crawling through mud, doing obstacle courses, rappelling off the World's Fair Tower in Knoxville. And I actually fainted on the rappelling tower. They pulled Mm -hmm. me back up uh, and said, okay, you're exempt because, you know, we can't lose you. I still had to do push-ups for that. But, um, but yeah, they were like yelling at you and making sure you were listening at all times and showing all the character qualities, all 49 of them that, you know, they were trying to beat into you. Uh, You would get punished over the slightest infraction, not respecting authority and stuff like that. And it was very badly done, too. There were kids just filing into the medical tent all the time with, you know, injuries and stuff like that. I fell down, tumbled down a hill on my first day, and they kept making me run. It was it, it was it was very poorly done, and I hated it. But some of my other friends who were more into that sort of thing, they loved it. Mm. Uh, I cried. I didn't want to go to it because I was a more indoorsy type. I preferred... You know, I I did have a little Commodore computer, which was like my, you know, one little thing that was free from a lot of scrutiny and I could learn how to program and I enjoyed doing that. But uh, going out and, you know, I had bad knees as a kid, you know, going out and doing stuff like that just didn't appeal to me. And I was told by my dad on the second day of Alert Cadet, which I, again, was tw- my 12th birthday. He took me out after all the alert activities uh, to take me out to dinner for my birthday And he told me while we were eating that the reason I was having trouble was that he had failed to raise me as a godly man. Uh, He said that I had failed spiritually to measure up to what would be needed in the future. Because he said, there will come a day where you're going to have a wife and children and some the government may come in and, you know, force you all to convert at the sword. So what are you going to do then? And... I was 12. I was thinking about that hamburger I just had for dinner. Like I wasn't thinking about stuff like that, but that's the message I got. I was failing at all this, not because I wasn't accustomed to it or I didn't have an interest in it. It was that I wasn't spiritual enough. Oh, wow. There's a lot to unpack there. The first thing that sticks out to me is this military training is not for, I don't know, teaching young men how to be responsible and follow a leader or whatever, whatever the the military teaches, I'm not going to get into that. (laughs) But it's to prepare you for essentially this apocalyptic world where the government's going to come for you and your family and you have to be able to fight back, literally. Or stand up for Christ or what have you. Got it. You remember I was talking about the strongholds in your heart earlier? Uh Uh-huh. We did this activity where we had to shoot water balloons at a hastily constructed representative of a stronghold and knocked down all the panels on our side while Satan up top was spraying us with a water hose and stuff, which granted was one of the more fun things that we did, but (laughs) everything had that little, um, little representation of, but this is indicative of a larger spiritual truth. Like, you know, this is the stuff that's actually happening in your heart right now. And this is what you got to do to like, take it down. And each water balloon is a scripture you can throw at it. And I'm just like, can we just have fun? Can we just <laughs> throw <not>. water balloons? <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, it seems like they hijacked your childhood with all of this religious indoctrination. Yep, it was, it, it was, it poisoned everything. Nothing you did, enjoyed, or anything uh, could happen without some kind of tie back to a spiritual thing or something that you were supposed to be taught in in this cult. Mm-hmm. There was nothing neutral. There was nothing just fun. It was all, you know, well, how does this line up with that? Or are you showing this character quality right now while you're doing that and stuff like that? Yeah. And I remember that type of thing in Mormonism with all the youth activities and everything. But at least I had public school, even though I did go to seminary when I was older, um, which in Utah you can put as an elective class that you go to during school hours, but I digress. Um, But at least I had 
a sort of quote normal life outside of Mormonism, um, you were completely isolated because your homeschooling system was also through IBLP and you could only interact with people who were part of the IBLP or the IFB or fit into those specific circles. So you really were just completely steeped in this religious ideology. Did you have any sort of awareness that there was an outside world that you wanted to belong to? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I knew that there were kids who went to regular school. I actually did have a girl in the church my dad pastored who went to a Christian school and she loved it. And my parents thought she was worldly as all get out, but there you go. Mm. But yeah, I knew that that existed, but my parents always told me that even though people look like they're having fun with that, inwardly they're you know, very sad or they're lacking something. We have the truth and we're happy uh, because of that. And of course, that was one of the reasons we went to went back to the Netherlands and Belgium as missionaries. Uh, my dad's hearing loss subsided to the point where he felt that he should go back. And even while we were there, the people we interacted with, we were not taught to view them as people. We were taught to view them as projects. These were people that were to be one to our way of thinking. Even if they were Christian, even if they were Protestant, Catholic, or what have you, we had to win them over to our version of Christian because otherwise they weren't doing life correctly. And, you know, we, every time we interacted with them, it had to be with the thought, we are trying to win these people to Christ. Yeah. So anytime we interacted with someone outside of all that, it was always to the, to the point of trying to get them in so familiar everything you just said i was like yep sounds like my childhood where they would say see those people out there on the outside who aren't mormon they look happy but they're not really happy they don't really know happiness only we know true happiness and if you leave you're never going to be happy again and it's like i want to be truly happy and that's why you have these the highest rates of use of antidepressants in utah where they're just like i'm happy i promise (laughs) <laughs> like, oh, that's not how it works. And it's okay to have regular human emotions. It's okay to have depression that you need to work through. Nobody is going to be perfect and no one's happy all of the time. And so it just creates this toxic positivity in this environment where you're faking it because you think that if you appear to be happy, then people know that you're worthy because they equate those two things in Mormonism. At least that's how I remember it. It was if you're not happy, it's because you're probably doing something wrong and you need to read your scriptures more. You need to pray harder. You need to do whatever you need to do to get right with Heavenly Father so that you can be happy. Yep. Uh, You're you're 100% on the money because that was one of the things they taught us in the Children's Institutes um, that I know uh, Lindsay talked about being one of the teachers in there. Of course, I was quite a bit younger, so I, uh, not too much younger, but, uh, <laughs> we, um, I actually grew up in some of the children's institutes, uh, whenever they would come through. And one of the songs that they taught us was, um, uh, if I may very briefly, sorry to everybody in ATI who grew up hearing this, but, uh, every day in this world, there are people that I beat. I walk up, shake their hands and they see the kind of person that I am by the smile that I wear. I am blessed by the smile Jesus gives me. So that was the whole idea. Like when you were out there in the world, you were supposed to be constantly smiling and constantly try to get people to come in and you know show the attractiveness of what you had to offer and what your truth was you know you had to be the shiny happy people to lure people in and you know it was uh like like you said you know we we were not at that point recognized as individuals especially as children we were props we were pawns to be used in the furtherance of the cult Mm mm-hmm wow You singing that song jogged a memory in me. (laughs) I think it's a Mormon song. And now I don't even know because still it's part of the depths of my brain that I've tried to bury. But if you're ex-Mormon out there, tell me if this is a real song. It's like, do the right thing and be happy. You must always choose the right. I don't know if that's how it went, but like 
do the right thing and be happy is on repeat right now and it's kind of creeping me out <laughs> yeah sorry because <laughs> yeah i'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who just went i had almost gotten that song out of my head thanks chad <laughs> <laughs> that's all right um okay so let's talk about what happened when you moved to the netherlands so yeah we moved to well we moved to belgium but we lived right on the border with the netherlands because mm-hmm. my parents wanted to work in both countries We moved to Belgium primarily because Belgium allowed us to homeschool and the Netherlands did not. Uh, The Netherlands had what was called a schoolplicht, which is a school requirement. And Belgium had a leerplicht, which was a learning requirement. As long as you could prove that you were learning, which that was debatable, you could homeschool your children. And so we moved when I was about 12 years old. It was December of 97. And... We were missionaries there in Belgium until 2004. And of course, you know, I had just, you know, become 12. I was, you know, starting to develop my own identity and everything. And then I got pulled away from what little social interaction I had. And we went off to this country where we do very few people. Like my folks still have some acquaintances from way back in the 70s and 80s when they were there before. But as far as like, kids my age and everything we were even more isolated somehow because cults are going to cult we did find two other families who were in the iblp one was a canadian family who were also missionaries they had nine kids at home and one was a colonel in the air force he had four daughters and um you know him and his wife and but they all lived like 30 minutes to an hour and a half away from us so we would get together very rarely and even when we did we were the bad ati family because we visibly had a tv in our home (laughs) the rest of them hid theirs Mm -hmm. but but you know even then you know as isolated as we were and without people who were fundamentalists like us because fundamentalism especially the american brand is not a thing over in europe right even without people like that around us and such we still managed to primarily um find the one or two families who were still uh involved and we mostly just spent most of our time with them wow from isolated to extremely isolated Mm -hmm. let's talk about that your teen years how long were you there Uh, until i was 19 okay so yeah i was there for seven years um And granted, I did come back to the States a couple of times during that. We would come back for furlough, for medical needs, and I also came back to the Patrick Henry College teen camps in 2001, which you may remember PHC from the last episode of Shiny Happy People as part of the Joshua generation. Mm. So I was involved in that too. But mostly, the majority of my time was spent overseas, and the idea was that we would we we tried to plant churches. We tried to get enough people together to where we would start a Bible study, try to teach them, you know, as much as we could about, you know, our fundamentalist views and stuff, get them saved, and then try to start a church with them and then move on and do it elsewhere. This did not work. I was just going to say, how did that go? <laughs> not well. Like, we passed out flyers. We we relied on mom and dad's old acquaintances and everything to try to get people in, but no one was really interested in like starting a church. They just wanted to, you know, have Bible studies and just keep it to like a small little group. Whereas dad had these visions of starting up this huge uh, spiritual movement in the Netherlands and Belgium. I mean, you know, if you're going to be a missionary, yeah, go to like two of the most affluent cultural christian countries in the world okay like yes they're secular and such but culturally like they were already christian they already knew everything and they knew it a lot better than you know us fundamentalists from alabama frankly yeah but we tried to do it that way and of course dad was constantly frustrated because you know we weren't getting any results from the people there we eventually did settle for because we were literally kicked out of the country at one point Uh The Belgian government took one look at what we were doing and was like, no, no, you're, you're not doing that here. Uh, he, my dad had started uh, volunteering as a chaplain at an Air Force base over in Belgium. And the commander of the base heard we were getting kicked out. And he's like, well, why don't we hire you to be officially our chaplain so you have to stay? So dad became a contracting chaplain for that Air Force base so we could stay in Belgium. And we started an off-base church with Americans 
that happened to be at least Fundy adjacent or Southern Baptist or what have you. So he settled for that, but that church didn't last any longer than we did over there. <laughs> Hold on. The government literally tried to kick you out. What were you guys doing over there? The government uh, in Bel... Because immigration laws and visas and everything are, you know, quite strict over in Europe as, you know, they're allowed to be. And they believe that by, uh, well, first of all, they believe that we were in something of a cult or a sect because Weird. they didn't know what the independent fundamental Baptist church was. And I'm like, now I agree with them. But at the time we were just like, well, this is common in America. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh -huh. And then, and second of all, they said that since dad was a preacher, you know, other people in Belgium could be preachers too. It's not something you need to bring someone in from the outside on. So we were taking jobs away from Belgians and therefore we had to go. So, at, yeah, at one point, we literally got a two-week notice to leave the country. They stopped picking up our trash. Uh, we actually had people like, uh, you know, some of the American service folks, they, they actually took our trash for us to, like, dump in their dumpsters and stuff like that. But it was um, it was a whole thing. You know, we were this close to getting kicked out until the Air Force intervened. <laughs> so Whoa. that was probably the most successful thing we did over there. And to this day, I highly regret that we ever did it at all. Mm-hmm. Okay, when you came back, that's so interesting that you spent your teen years there. I mean, there's probably a lot more we could get into. Is there anything else you want to share about your teen years in Belgium? Basically that, you know, I didn't belong to a youth group, really. I didn't do a lot of the things that a lot of normal um, kids do over here in the States. Not even normal homeschoolers, <laughs> even for what we consider normal. You know, it, I didn't have much of a social group, so I kind of, and for an chronic extrovert like myself that was absolute torture i spent a lot of time sincerely wanting to be back in the states and you know wanting to be among friends and do teenager things which of course you know, teenagerhood's a myth so uh, at least do adulty things i was allowed to do that was not allowed so i did take solace in the few times i did come back over to the states and i just kind of tried to ride that wave through it but I feel like I missed out on a lot of like core developmental memories and experiences and stuff like that, that I'll never get back because, mm -hmm. you know, at the time we were focused on the mission, which was to bring as bring in as many people as possible to fundamentalism. And it was one of my biggest regrets is that I spent so much time in a different culture, having an opportunity that very few people get to have being immersed in another country and getting to know a new kind of people and opening up my world. And I still kept myself in a bubble. Granted, my parents had a lot to do with that, but I had sufficient opportunities, even as a teenager to try to open my mind up. And I, kept burying myself deeper into my IBLP uh, zone and such. And it was a wasted opportunity. I wish I could go back and appreciate those countries for what they were, not what I wanted them to be. That's a bummer. But I also feel like when you grow up in an environment like that, you probably, and it sounded like you started to become invested in it. You probably didn't know you really had options, even though you could see it in front of you, you're still in this tunnel vision view where you feel like this is a straight and narrow and I need to stick with it. Were you, did you feel like you were pretty indoctrinated at that point to wanting to stick to IBLP and not feeling so isolated but wanting it? Yes. I mean, well, my younger siblings at that point had started to move into other homeschooling curriculum like Abeka and such, but my folks kept me in IBLP until I graduated. They told me that their desire for me was to become a preacher or a politician or somebody who could affect change because they were like, you know, you like to talk, you like to get up in front of people. So that should be what God uses you for later. And so I thought that that was going to be my fate. I actually ended up being the music director for uh, the little church chapel things that we had on the military base and a failed attempt over in uh, the Netherlands. And sometimes we would do three or four services a day in two languages. I had like this little electric piano mm -hmm. that I would like pre-program things in and I would lead music while the piano was playing a MIDI tune, you know? And so I, at that point I was thinking, well, this is going to be my future. My future is in fundamentalism in some form, whether it's, you know, affecting change on the national stage or as a preacher or as a church worker. And yeah, I, I didn't know how many options there were for me out there. 
And, you know, I didn't have really any vocational training. My mom gave up basically on teaching me anything in my teen years. I mostly just read through the books myself and just did the little quizzes at the end. And she focused on my younger siblings. My dad really didn't teach me much. He claimed that we thought too differently for him to teach me stuff like math and all that, which was his domain. So I mostly taught myself as a teenager. I didn't know like what careers there were available, what college would look like other than the few fundamentalist colleges that my parents approved of that I wasn't too happy about. So yeah, I, I just didn't know what the world had for me. And that's another huge regret of mine is my, my world was so small that even on the other side of the world, it was still just what was in front of my nose. Yeah, that's so hard. What happened when you got back to the States? Did you want to go to college? I thought about going to Patrick Henry College, which was the school in Percival, Virginia, that was founded to put homeschool kids in government. I didn't have the ACT scores to get a scholarship there at the time, but I did for uh, Pensacola Christian College, which was a well-respected fundamentalist school, at least in our circles, unaccredited, of course, at the time, but my parents really strongly encouraged me to go there. But I had a bad feeling about some of their policies, and I had heard some terrible stories from friends about the rules there and how they would try to trip you up and trap you into expelling you. So I eventually ended up turning down a scholarship from there because I just didn't feel right about going. I felt scared. I had grown up in that fear all my life, and I was like, well, I don't want to continue that through college. Mm -hmm. So I decided to take a gap year, which I am actually still on. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it was hard at first to like try to find a way to fit in the workplace because one thing the IBLP doesn't teach you is any kind of actual work skills. So... I eventually ended up working for a church in Natchez, Mississippi that my dad also just so happened to work for. And I became their music minister while taking a day job as a computer tech, which I pretty much learned on the job. I've always had an interest in technology, so I picked things up pretty quick and I went to work for them for about a year. Oh, my goodness. So... At this point, are you feeling any sort of pressure because you're still invested in IBLP um, doctrines? Are you thinking about going forward on anybody or trying to get married young? My dad had always taught me that the man, of course, was in charge of the household, was the head of the household, and everything that happened in the family was ultimately the man's responsibility. That scared me to death <laughs> because... I really wasn't the kind who liked the idea of being some kind of autocrat or some kind of dictator over a house. And I especially didn't like the idea of having to be responsible to the God of the universe for what other individual human beings were doing. So when I first started out on my own, not having many working skills and just being a, you know, still in the system and focused on the ministry, because that's all I had ever known, I was scared to death to really uh, pursue any kind of relationship. Add to that the idea of purity culture, which was heavily taught in IBLP. You were not allowed to date. You had to do what was called courtship, which is essentially arranged marriage by the families of two different people, boy and a girl. Uh, they would decide that their kids were a good fit for each other. And then there would be a brief pursuement period, like a lot of people saw with the Duggars. And then you got married within a couple of months, whether you were compatible or not. And I just was scared to death of having to go through all that. And of course, getting it wrong, because getting it wrong meant that you had failed. You weren't listening close enough to God, that you were spiritually insufficient, like I was in the alert cadets. You know, I knew that I wasn't the kind of person who could just justify everything as being God's plan. I was sincerely listening for that voice at all times and not finding that guidance. Mm -hmm. And other people seemed to do it. And I did notice that a very particular kind of person, especially a kind of male, would be able to do that with no problem. I found out later it was mostly men who were justifying their own wills as some kind of divine inspiration. But I didn't learn that trick. I was so scared of screwing up that I didn't even dare for the longest time. Then when I did start dating later, after I had left that church through 
a whole set of circumstances. I tried to, I tried to soften the whole courtship stance by dating with a purpose, but I still had this obsession with getting it right the first time because we were taught that if you gave pieces of your heart away to other people before you were married, you would never be able to give your spouse your whole heart. And predictably, I fell flat on my face the first few times I tried to pursue a relationship. Mm. So at that point, I felt like I had failed in that too. <laughs> That's so sad. Let's talk more about why you decided to leave or what was it that started to wake you up to everything? So at the church in Mississippi, I was working under a very young pastor who had taken over the church that ran the mission that sent us out as missionaries. And we worked together for a year on what was essentially a failing church. It had been run by a man named Dr. James Crumpton, who I would find out later ran the church with an iron fist. When he died, people just fell away and never came back. This new pastor was not that pastor, although he is aspired to be, but he didn't want to come down too hard lest he run more people off. Turns out that he was ruling his home with an iron fist because his wife left at some point and charged him with emotional abuse, mm. which actually hit the papers and he resigned the church. She came back about a month later and they pretended like everything was okay and he wanted to be pastor again, please and thank you. I smelled a rat, and to his credit, so did my dad. We both vigorously opposed that, saying there is something wrong here. And it turns out this had happened at a church before, but we had not been privy to that. So we fought vigorously against it, but he got enough of a support in the church where they voted him back in as pastor. I resigned on the spot and moved back to Alabama. I never got over that hurt because we did everything correctly according to our interpretation of the scripture. You know, I was so sure that we had the Bible on our side. We had God on our side. We did everything by the book and it still failed. Mm -hmm. And when I talked to dad about it, he said, well, the best thing to do is just not talk about it because that could hurt the ministry, which I thought was weird yeah. because dad had never been shy about talking about sin before. So I was like, hmm, I filed that away in my head and I just could not get over the fact that the solution to this injustice was to be quiet about it. So when I moved back to Alabama, eventually started out on my own properly, I joined another fundamentalist church, which I thought was a whole lot better. But then I started noticing certain patterns, both in the church I was in and in other fundamentalist churches that I had seen. I started researching online what some other churches have been up to, some other allegations, some recovery groups for people who had grown up in fundamentalism. And I started seeing stories of abuse start to be shared. And I was like, why was I never told about this? Then I found out through my friend groups that people I had grown up with in Alabama and elsewhere who were in IBLP had been abused. And some of these were my close friends. I knew that a few of them had kind of disappeared and had moved off, but I didn't know what had happened to them. And when I found out, I felt betrayed that no one had ever told me the truth of what happened. We're talking sexual abuse, physical abuse, all that sort of thing. And I was always like, why didn't anybody tell me this? And like, well, we didn't want the ministry to look bad. Mm. So I found out later that, um, and this actually did become major news, the pastor of the church that my dad first went to seminary at in Hammond, Indiana, uh, the pastor, Jack Scott, who was pastor of First Baptist Church Hammond and the leader of Hiles Anderson College, where my dad went, he was arrested and convicted of transporting a minor over state lines for sexual purposes. Mm. I approached dad about this. Because at about that same time, I found out that his father-in-law, who had founded this ministry, he was also guilty of very similar things in his own life. And I talked to dad about it, and I said, all this happened, what gives? And he said, well, no one could ever really prove all that. And I was like, that's the wrong answer. I said, you knew, and you never talked about this. I was like, why? He's like, well, talking about it hurts the ministry. I said, dad, it's in the paper. It's on the news. Like people know about this. What are we doing about it? 
I said, and here's a story, here's a story, here's a story, here's people I grew up with. What's going on? You know, because this is happening way too long to be a coincidence. And he's like, well, you know, just sometimes things happen. And I was just, he's like, well, yeah, we just need to focus on the ministry and that's it. And I'm like, that's not good enough. Like, it, I didn't sign up to hurt people and people are being hurt. And if you're not willing to talk about it when it's your friends, then why call out sin at all? Mm -hmm. So we had a big argument about it. And that was about the time I left fundamentalism entirely. I had been, I had still been leading music at his church that he had started in his hometown. And he actually fired me from doing that after our argument. Only job I've ever been fired from. And it was my dad who did it. <laughs> so after that, I found the website Recovering Grace, where people talked about their experiences with IBLP. And that pushed me pretty much over the edge because not only was this now part of my church life, this went to the very core of what I've been taught my entire life, my education from kindergarten or not kindergarten, but from like second or third grade onward, everything I've been taught through the wisdom booklets, through IBLP is now being laid bare. And all these people are talking about, Hey, I experienced a lot of pain and hurt in this. And then the allegations against Gothard came forward. And I saw it all happening again. And I said, I'm done. I said, I can't even, you know, lip service sanction this any longer. I am leaving anything that has to do with fundamentalism, IVLP, the IFB, you name it. And that was the final uh, straw, really. It was just seeing how this culture of silence and people not wanting to talk and people, you know, finally you know, daring to share their stories. That's what got me out. Because like I said, at the end of the day, I didn't sign up to hurt people. And I grieve the fact that I was ever part of anything that hurt people. Yeah. That still haunts me to this day. Well, and I think it's important to point out that, of course, there's going to be abusive people in every type of church or group or whatever across the world. Right. But what we're seeing here are patterns of abuse and patterns of silence and cover-up and patterns of protecting the perpetrators and blaming the victims. And I think it's really impor important to say that this ideology and these principles made it worse. They exacerbated it and they yes. made it so you can blame the victim and it's a perpetrator's paradise. And so it's becoming more of a problem instead of just a bad apple here and there. The thing about a bad apple is, you know, they cause more spoilage, you know, but it, everybody I grew up with was apparently in the Apple, uh, Apple protection program because <laughs> they, the, I'm serious. They, they, the idea was protect the ministry by protecting the wrongdoers. Yeah. Now, granted, you know, you could be yelled at, you could be uh, talked about and everything for something as simple as having a TV in your house if you were low level. But one thing I noticed is the more important you were to the ministry, the more you could get away with. Bill Gother being the prime example of that. Yeah. No one lived by all the IBLP rules. Not even Bill Gother. But it depended on how useful you were as to how much you could get away with and how much people were willing to cover up for you. Like I said in the documentary, the minute Bill Gother stopped being useful to IBLP, was when he was basically, uh, you know, forced to resign. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, he's still trying to get weasel his way back into IBLP. There was a lawsuit and everything. But one of the things that absolutely got me out was my dad had spent a lot of his early ministry talking about ministries that were doing wrong and things he couldn't agree with. And all of a sudden, when it came later down in his life with these particular ministries, he just completely lost his nerve. One of the last things he told me when we had a last honest conversation, because he did die back in 2020, one of the last honest conversations we had, he told me, he said, son, I know that there were people high up who did things that probably should have landed them in jail. And I knew it was happening, but it wasn't my place to say anything about it. And I said, dad, whose place was it? You're in an independent fundamental Baptist church. There is no central authority there. You're a pastor. That is the highest rank you can get. Why couldn't you say something? Well, that's just not how things were done. I couldn't respect that. And one of the things that I've purposed to do ever since then is do as much as I can to get, keep anyone else from being hurt. 
I know that I was a child in most of this, but I was also an adult in some of this, and I spent time trying to win people into this ideology. The very least I can do is to try to prevent others from being hurt. And that's why I spoke out, and that's why I support the people who are doing what they can to try to get places like IBLP shut down and to make the world safer for kids, homeschooled or not, to get the education and the opportunities that they deserve. Yeah, that's incredibly admirable. Thank you for what you're doing. It means a lot to a lot of people. Well, I'm just one small part of it, and there are people who are doing way bigger things. Um, You know, I'm consistently proud of my friends, Lindsay and Heather in particular. Heather wrote a book uh, with an emphasis on her uh, story, emphasizing how educational neglect hurts kids. Lindsay's been out there. We've been side by side trying to take down IBLP. Literally, we actually snuck into headquarters one time. Uh, We got permission to do so somehow. (laughs) But uh, it's a a whole story. But, But, and there are other places like the Coalition for Responsible Home Education, which is made up of people who... um, were abused in homeschooling who are trying to advocate for homeschool kids and common sense reform in homeschooling to make sure no one else gets hurt. These are the people on the front lines and these are the people I support and love. And I'm just, you know, hopefully doing my part to try to make sense of, you know, what this cult was, how it poisoned everything. Even to this day, we're still feeling the aftershocks of what this cult did to society. And the fact that it still exists, I take as a personal insult. I'm not going to be happy until it shuts down because even though it's smaller than it was and it's dying on the vine, every child that they continue to hurt is one child too many. Yeah, I agree. And I appreciate you calling out people who are doing great work, but I don't want you to minimize, Chad, your contribution. Well, thank you. And thank and as people like you who have been supporting myself and others who have been giving us this voice, I can't thank you enough for your part in helping us uh, make this happen. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, we all want to know how you're doing now. And aside from this advocacy work and everything that you're doing, what makes you happy and finding joy and at peace? I have, I've had a great life in general uh, since becoming independent of the cult and finding my own happiness and my own desires and my own people uh, to hang with. Um, I have been pursuing things like improv comedy, which has been a huge passion of mine. You know, it turns out I do like getting in front of people and I do like talking <laughs> quite a bit. And it's fun to do that with partners on stage who have your back and you can actually make amazing stories out of basically nothing. And I enjoy doing that. And some of the tech skills I learned while a computer tech and working on some sound stuff and churches and stuff, that has actually served me well in, you know, providing technical help to these troops as well. Another thing I love doing, of course, uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, I still enjoy traveling. I have a, I did get a head start on that and I have a life goal to hit all seven continents. I've got four down, three to go. So, so things like that you know, really make me happy. Um, Back in Alabama, but I'm living on it in my own terms. And I love the city where I live, Birmingham. It's an up and coming little revitalizing city. And it's just, um, it's a great vibe. And some of the best people I know live here. And I'm genuinely happy. You know, granted, you know, things are still difficult. I still struggle with a lot. And I do go to therapy uh, to, to handle that. And, you know, I'm a big advocate for, you know, go to therapy, take your meds, do what you have to do for your mental health. And, um, but I do believe that even with what the cult tried to do to me, they failed because their idea was to break me completely and rebuild in their image. They might have bent me a little bit, but they never broke me. And, the survivors who are out there speaking their truth, they didn't break them either. And again, they really messed up by trying to make world changers because that's what we intend to do. Just we're going to make the world better now, not whatever they were trying to do. 
Absolutely. I think that's awesome. I love all of that. Improv is really hard. People don't realize. I did a few classes with UCB and it's it's hard stuff, but I, I'm sure I'm you're a natural at it. You're jealous? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love UCB. Yeah, they're great. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the, the originals, right? That in Second City. But that's awesome. So happy for you. And I love everything that you're doing. And so we need to get your little listen moment. Sassy statement or something inspirational. I'm going to go back to what I said at the end of Shining Happy People. Spoilers if you haven't seen it already. <laughs> but one thing that really just stands out to me is high controlled religions, cults, and the like. They ultimately, as much as they try to keep you down, the reason they're doing so is that you are what they fear most. If you are in a cult or a high controlled religion, or if you ever have been, the reason they want to keep you down is so that you are not a threat to them. And I get just the biggest joy of knowing that all we had to do was talk. And I encourage everyone, whether you are an IVLP or whether you are in some other abusive situation, as much as you're safely able to, don't be afraid to share your story. However you can do it safely, However you can do it where you're comfortable, your voice matters and your voice may help someone avoid the same pain you went through. So I encourage you, if you're able, if you can do so safely, share your story. Beautiful. Linda, listen, your voice matters. Yes. I love it. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing because your voice matters too. Thank you, Shalisa. And hey, thank you for amplifying so many voices and thank you for your voice. Aww. It truly makes a difference. Thank you. I definitely hope so. I love seeing those comments of people who are saying it's been helpful in some way. And yeah, I can't respond to all the comments. But when I do see the ones on my phone in the little YouTube studio app, every now and then I'll look at it. And I'm like, oh, yay, it's helping people. It makes me so happy. And it helps us keep going. It gives us that motivation to keep pushing harder and keep finding more people to amplify and it's great. It's hard work, but it's important work. And so I appreciate you and yeah, thanks for being on. Thanks again for having me. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I've told you like three times. Thanks for coming. Um, okay. <laughs> if you want to follow him guys, you can check out his Instagram at archradish85 and TikTok at archradish. We'll put all of his links in the description. And yeah, he's got some great content. So go check that out. Do you have any other final thoughts before we go? Once again, if I can plug, uh, be sure to uh, support the uh, Coalition for Responsible Home Education. Uh, they have been really doing some good work and um, I support what they're doing. Just, uh, yeah, stand up for, for homeschool kids. Yeah, we'll put that link in the description too. And you guys, if you're out there watching and you want to leave those words of encouragement, it would mean a lot. We do read the comments and so do our guests. And if you want to support further, just liking, sharing, all the things, you can become a patron too. Patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. Can't even say my own name. <laughs> I'm struggling today. Um, you can get some merch if you want at cults to consciousness.com under the merch tab. And if you like this video, I'll link two more down here below. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well.